all month of October is set apart for remembering our pastors and things. Uh, in the early service, uh, we uh, did this and presented them with a gift from the church, but wanted everybody to uh, realize what uh, a benefit we have here at this church. So many churches are empty this morning or have somebody just filled them in their pulpits, and uh, we have two great pastors here, and uh, being a, a deacon. But being a deacon, we kind of get inside and ask to go with them sometimes, and uh, you know, uh, wonderful pastors, but they're also just husbands, fathers, and things, and they have lives that go on all the time, but with one phone call, they can get pulled into somebody else's grief and pain and things like that. They have to bear this. Oftentimes, the only one because it's something confidential. And uh, if you don't realize it, uh, today's Sunday School lesson talks about spiritual warfare. And, uh, you know, we're all involved in it. And we come here to get uh, more instruction and kind of pick up our ammo and be able to fight for that week. And so uh, just remember our pastors all year long, not just on the day. And uh, we're so thankful to have them. And uh, Lewis is going to pray for them for here in a minute. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Keith. Let's talk about Sunday school for a second. This morning, of course, it's fall break. I don't know who invented fall break, but anyway. <laughs> We've got a lot of people gone today, but anyway, pray for them that they have safe, to have a good time with their families and their uh, have a safe journey. Uh, let them know when you see them again that we missed them. So we missed them. But today we had 128 was our, our Sunday school this morning, which is good. Uh, four visitors, so that's always good to have a guest with us in Sunday school in our small group. But let me tell you what's happening November 5th. Of course, that's our time change. We're going back, we're all back an hour, so you got an extra hour to think about this. But we're going to have high attendance in our Sunday school on November the 5th. That's four weeks from today. But what's also really exciting, or actually for me, for Sunday school director, and should be for our church and everybody get excited about it, we're starting two new Sunday school classes on November the 5th. Tim Brown and Carrie. <laughs> I'm going to add Carrie to this. They're at the balcony right now. But Tim is going to be leading a group of uh, like 20 to 30 year old people that aren't connected. We want to get everyone as many people as we can connected to our small group. So Tim and Carrie are uh, going to be doing a uh, small group for like 20 to 30 year old in the 30s. I said this first service, 29. If you're 29, still 29, you're still good. <laughs> so, but anyway, our that age group, and then Brother Sam's is going to be starting a new class for 30 to 40 year old people. So, be in prayer for both of these new classes. So, if you're not connected to a small group, we, this is a way that you can get connected and be the first ones in this class, the first part of it, be, uh, uh, be the nucleus of a new class developing. And uh, the importance of a small class is you build a relationship with each other, with each of the people in your class. But you build a relationship or a closer relationship with our Lord and Savior as a group. And that's what why a small group in a church is so important. A Sunday school um, is real important for a church. So be in prayer as we start these two new classes and keep thinking of people that you know are connected to a small group that we can get connected to the, to them in these two groups, two classes. And uh, will we uh, just allow God to be at work and use us as a tool to bring people closer to him? That's what it's all about. So let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning. Dear Lord, we thank you for the many blessings you've given us. We thank you for this day that we can come and worship together. We ask that you 
continue to be with Brother Richard and be with Zach as they lead us here on the church field. Guide them and direct them and continue to bless them. We pray for each and every one of them here, every one of the people that are here. We ask your blessings upon this service and they, they will all grow closer to you. And then if there's someone that does not have a personal relationship with you, we pray, dear Lord, that today you will come into their heart. These things we ask in your name. Amen. Stand with me, if you would, please. We're going to sing a house, excuse me, a song called The Father's House. <clears throat> Yeah. 
the Ukrainian refugees in Israel. <coughs> Population 13,500. God is near to the suffering. A Ukrainian Jewish family in a desperate situation felt they had to escape war-torn Ukraine. When Israel invited Ukrainians to resettle in their ancient homeland, the family took the opportunity. Once in Israel, the religion and culture felt familiar, but everything else was different. The family was dazed from what they experienced, but God provided believers in Israel to help them. They assisted with food, lodging, and other necessities. The Ukrainian family saw the love of Jesus in the believers' lives and decided to follow Jesus. We thank God for working through those people and through all people. Psalm 91 2 says, I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Are there any local prayer concerns this morning? That is all, and the altar is now open for prayer.
hard times. And I just ask that we continue to seek you in all that we do, even when we're scared, uh, even when we don't have answers, God. I just pray that we would find comfort in, in trusting you, that you're working all things for our good. And thank you for your son dying on the cross for our sins. Forgive us for our failures. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Stand with us if you would please. We're going to sing a song called Open the Eyes of My Heart.
you take your Bible, please, and open it to 1 Kings chapter 17. 1 Kings chapter 17. Every morning I try to begin my day by uh, reading a devotional from the Uversion Bible app, and several of you participate in those uh, devotions with me, along with people from uh, my hometown in Paducah, and from uh, where I went to school in Virginia, and uh, just across the country, and I'm grateful for each of those individuals that take part in that, and there's always room for more, so let me just take an opportunity to, to tell you how you can participate if you'll download that new version Bible app, uh, and then you can just send out a friend request to me, and once we're connected, then I can invite you to participate in those devotionals with us. I think there's some information on the screen about how you can do that. The great thing about these is that you can go at your own pace, so everybody just does it when uh, they have an opportunity to do that. We're not uh, all set on a particular time, and everybody has to read them together, and then there is a section where you can make comments, and some people will interact in that way, but you don't have to. Uh, you can just participate, because the main thing is we're really wanting to hear from God. We just sang this song about God opening the eyes of our heart. We also need our spiritual ears to be open to hear the voice of God, and there are a lot of voices that are speaking to us every single day, right? Lots of voices. There are uh, all those external voices, your family, your friends, maybe coworkers or uh, classmates, or we hear the voices that come to us from the radio or the television, or we hear the voices from the things that we uh, read on social media or an email that we might receive or the news or the internet and every day we are just bombarded with all of these voices telling us what to believe and what to do and how to interpret things that are going on in this world and even right now you're listening to my voice sometimes there is also uh, that voice in your head that speaks to you. And hopefully, uh, there are times when that's a good voice, when it's what we might call your conscience, and it's convicting you and helping you to make wise choices and good decisions, but there are other times when that voice in our head is pretty irrational. And the voice that we hear often is one that is tempting us to think and do things that are not in line with God's Word. It is a voice of temptation. There are several passages in the Bible that suggest that our thoughts are often filled uh, with sinful intentions. In fact, Paul even says that we need to take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. So every day, you're hearing all of these voices that influence your thoughts and your behaviors. And yet, how often do we listen to the voice of God? We may talk to God in prayer. We may talk about God. But how often do we talk with God? So let, let's just think about it. Uh, Lewis, you prayed this morning, right, at the beginning of this service. Uh, we uh, heard Zach pray a moment ago. How many of you prayed when you got up this morning or uh, prayed over a meal? How many of you will pray at least at some point during the day today, uh, maybe before you have a meal or before you go to bed? So there's multiple times that we talk to God. But how often do we allow him to talk to us? How often do we listen to his voice? Have you ever had a conversation with someone and they said, are you even listening to me right now? I was at a doctor's appointment and 
there was this lady there, and she had a young child with her, and the little boy, he was just playing at her feet with some toy, and she's, you know, on her phone, and she's just scrolling and reading, and this little boy, he starts saying, Mom, hey, Mom, look. Look at this, Mom. Mom, hey, Mom. And she never once looks up from her phone. She just continues to read and scroll. And it's like she never heard the kid's voice. I'm going to tell you, I heard the kid's voice. Mom, mom, hey, mom. And then I got to thinking, she does hear his voice. She's just choosing not to listen to it. And there are times when I think we do the same with God, right? There are times when he tries to speak to us. And that actually brings us to the story in First Kings chapter 17. God had been trying to speak to a man named Ahab, who was king over Israel, but he had not been listening. And I read this story in First Kings chapter 17 in one of those you version devotions this week. And then I also happened to open up another devotion and in Luke chapter 4, Jesus is talking about this same story that happened in 1 Kings 17. So I read this devotion from the Old Testament, 1 Kings 17. I read this devotion from the New Testament, Luke chapter 4, that makes reference to the story. And now I'm trying to think, is this just a coincidence? Or is God really trying to speak to me and reveal something to me? I'm fully convinced that God does speak to us through his word. In fact, in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 11, it says that these things were written down for us, the experiences of the past, as an example for us or as warnings for us. In the Old Testament and the New Testament, there is a phrase that repeatedly appears that says, Today, if you hear God's voice... Do not harden your heart. So what is it that God might be trying to tell us today? Well, we're going to look at 1 Kings chapter 17 together. In fact, over the next couple of weeks, we're going to be looking at this chapter and into uh, chapter 18 as well. But I want to kind of break it down into some smaller sections so that we can really take the time to absorb each piece of it and see what God is saying to us. One of the commentaries that I often use in preparation for delivering a message to you will actually take the original text and it will first try to look at what's the context of the original story, the who, what, when, where, and why, and then it will try to then bridge that to our current culture. And I want us to try to do that today so that we can make some application because one of the reasons that I think there are so many people who are not in church today or not personally engaged with God throughout the week is simply because they don't think it's relevant. They don't see how it has anything to do with their day-to-day -day lives. And I would go so far as to say they don't see how it's relevant in your life either. I know you come to church. I know you talk about God. You might even try to be a morally good person. But we are so distracted by the voices of this world that God can never fully get our attention. He's just not relevant in our day-to-day -day lives. I I've often said, and you know this to be true, even though you are here today and you have great intentions, life will hit you in the face as soon as you leave this building. And as much as you might want this to be relevant, it's hard. There are a lot of distractions. And that's what was happening in 1 Kings chapter 17. And it was the indictment that Jesus gave to the people from his own hometown in Luke chapter 4. They were listening to the voices of the world instead of the voice of God. So let's dig in. Let's see what happened in the past and then how we can apply it to our lives. This morning we're just going to look at the first six verses of chapter 17. Now Elijah the Tishbite 
from Tishbe and Gilead, said to Ahab, As the Lord, the God of Israel, lives, whom I serve, there will be neither dew nor rain in the next few years, except at my word. Then the word of the Lord came to Elijah, Leave here, turn eastward, and hide in the Kerith ravine east of the Jordan. You will drink from the brook, and I have ordered the ravens to feed you there. So he did what the Lord had told him. He went to the Kerith ravine east of the Jordan and stayed there. The ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning and bread and meat in the evening, and he drank from the brook. Now, the events of 1 Kings 17, they happen about 60 years after the death of David's son, Saul. The dynasty of David and Solomon had fallen into ruins, and the twelve tribes of Israel had divided into two kingdoms. The ten northern tribes continued to be known as the nation of Israel, while the tribes of Benjamin and Judah in the south were known as the nation of Judah. And the city of Jerusalem is located within the tribe of Judah, and so the nation of Israel set up Samaria as their capital city in the north. And King Ahab was ruling in Samaria. And it's during that time that God's using this prophet named Elijah to call the people to repentance. And in the previous chapter, chapter 16, we learned a little bit about Ahab's spiritual condition. Let's look at it. 1630. First Kings 1630. It says, Ahab, son of Omri, did more evil in the eyes of the Lord than any of those before him. So what kind of evil did Ahab do that led the people into sin and rebellion against God? Well, first of all, according to verse 31, he, it says he considered sinning against God something to be trivial, something of no consequence. He didn't give it any thought. He, he built no remorse, no conviction for rejecting God's standards. And I want us to be careful, and I want to caution you, that we don't make the same mistake. This past Wednesday, the youth uh, met out in the parking lot in front of the Christian Life Center. They had worship out there. They put, Zach put up the big screen and had lyrics on the screen for them to all sing and Praise God together, and it was a, a great time. And, and you, I, I want to make sure you understand. Hear me clearly. There are some of these teenagers that are truly seeking an authentic relationship with Christ, and I'm grateful for that. However, after they had been uh, singing about God and honoring Him, I overheard a young boy talking to a group of other teenagers, and uh, he was cussing. And, and he didn't think anything about it. It was a trivial thing, is how this verse reads. He considered it a light thing, of, of no consequence. And I would suspect some of you feel the same way. One of the young girls, she tried to redirect him, and she said, uh, watch, watch your mouth. You're, you're at church. And, and my immediate thought was, what difference does it make of where your body is with what comes out of your mouth? You're, you're supposed to honor God wherever you are, right? Yeah. Anyway, that, that's just one small example of the ways that we take sin lightly, how, how we dismiss the convicting voice of God. And cursing may not be an issue for you, but then you need to ask God to reveal to you those areas in your life where you do take sin lightly. Maybe pray a prayer like David who said, Search me, O God, see if there is anything offensive within me. I've heard pastors mention that verse many times. I've used it many times. Search me, O God, see if there is anything offensive within me. Then listen to him. See, it's easy to say this first part, isn't it? Yeah, search me, oh God. See if there's anything offensive. I don't want to hear about it. Don't tell me what they are. 
As long as you know, that's enough. No! The, the whole idea is it's a convicting thing, right? According to verse 31 of chapter 16, Ahab not only considered sinning against God to be a trivial thing, he married a woman who did not worship God. In fact, she worshipped another god named Baal. Her name was Jezebel. Her father was F. Baal. He was king of the Sidonians. And the name F. Baal means with God, or, or, or excuse me, with Baal. Baal is on my side. So there's no question about the religious upbringing of Jezebel. Her family worshipped a foreign god, a false god. They didn't honor the god of the Israelites. And yet Ahab married her anyway. He compromised his faith. He entered into a political alliance with another royal family for his own advantage. And again, I want us to take notice. Let's try to bridge this context now to our current culture, how we do the same thing. We ignore the voice of God. We enter into alliances with other people who do not share our faith, who do not share our convictions. Because we think that that connection with them will be advantageous to us in some way. We compromise our faith. We ignore the obvious. I, I know too many Christian young men and Christian young women who have got involved with somebody who is not a believer, who doesn't have a strong faith in God, and they will unite with them because they think that person makes them happy. I know people who have compromised their morals when it comes to politics because they think that it will help them to be better financially or because their relationships with other people are more important than their allegiance to God. Ahab, he, he even went so far to appease his wife and her family. He built a temple for Baal in Samaria, the capital city of Israel. What a slap in the face to God. Well, let's just set up a throne for Satan in God's own house. That, that sounds absurd, doesn't it? We do the same thing. We allow images and words to enter the temple of God, the very body that Jesus bought with his own blood. And we contaminate it. We fill God's temple with vulgarity and profanity, and we think nothing of it. You should also notice in verse 33, Ahab, he builds an altar to the goddess of Shirah in Samaria. He's unapologetic about mixing religions. And once again, it's obvious many Christians are guilty of doing the same thing. There are so many Christians who don't know what they believe or why they believe it. They don't know what the Bible actually says. And they'll just embrace the belief systems of the people around them. The last verse of chapter 16, it tells us something else about Ahab and his relationship with God. It, it claims that he most likely financed or at least approved of the rebuilding of the city of Jericho. Now, this is significant. You remember Jericho was the very first town that God allowed the Israelites to overtake as they entered the promised land. Remember, they marched around it seven times, blew the trumpets, marched around it, and then what happened to the walls? And the walls fell down. And for centuries, the city of Jericho had laid in ruins. The rubble was a memorial reminder to the people of how that God had given them this land. And in fact, Joshua had put a curse upon the city and said, anybody that tries to rebuild Jericho, it will cost them great. In fact, it will cost them their firstborn son and their youngest son. And we see that's what happened to a man named Hael. And Ahab approved of him building this city. I am sharing all of this with you to show you the mindset of Ahab as Elijah appears to him in 1 Kings 17. Here's what he 
Here was a man who was supposed to be God's representative to an entire nation. And he had no regard for God's word, no regard for God's ways. There's one other thing that I have not yet mentioned to you about Baal that I think is significant. He was considered to be the god of rain, the god of fertility. And in fact, the idols that are supposed to represent Baal show him with a club of thunder in one hand and a lightning bolt in the other. And the people believed that this god was the one who provided rain for their crops and dew for the ground and the snow in, in the winter time. So now we see the importance of Elijah's words. He says, as the Lord, the God of Israel lives whom I serve, there will be neither dew nor rain in the next few years except at my word. He's saying the rain doesn't come from Baal, it comes from God. Rain is this life-giving resource. There's two rainy seasons in Israel, the spring and in the fall. It, it helps with uh, planting and harvesting the crops. And the rainwater filled the streams and the wells or cisterns that the people use for drinking. If, if the rain stopped for just a few weeks or, or maybe even a few months, then A, had the people of Israel, they would have just said, oh, that's, that's a coincidence. However, Elijah said it would not rain. There would not even be enough moisture in the air for there to be dew on the ground in the morning, unless God said so. And this would last for several years. When the people of Israel entered the land of promise, God warned them through Moses that if they didn't honor him, that something like this would happen. In Deuteronomy 28, verses 23 and 24, it says, The sky over your head will be bronze." The ground beneath you iron. The Lord will turn the rain of your country into dust and powder. It will come down from the skies until you are destroyed. Some of you might remember in your history classes, U.S. history classes, of uh, a drought that happened in the 1930s in the Midwest. And it became so dry that they referred to this area as what? The Dust Bowl. The dust bowl. There were 35 million acres of farmland that became unsuitable for growing crops during that drought. Now, just for a little context, the entire state of Kentucky is just a little under 26 million acres. Thousands of people uh, left Oklahoma and Kansas and Nebraska. They couldn't survive. According to Jesus in Luke chapter 4, this drought in Israel, it lasted three and a half years. Things had gotten so bad that people were even killing their livestock because there wasn't enough water for the animals and the people. The rivers and streams run dry. The crops won't grow. This is a dire situation. And they had the people, they thought the Baal, the God of rain and fertility would provide for them. But God proves he's in control. In Jeremiah chapter 14, it kind of describes the conditions that they were experiencing. As the nobles send their servants for water, they go to the cisterns but find no water. They return with their jars unfilled, dismayed and despairing. They cover their heads. The ground is cracked because there is no rain in the land. The farmers are dismayed and cover their heads. Even the doe of the field deserts her newborn fawn because there is no grass. Wild donkeys stand on the barren heights and pant like jackals. Now, I also thought it was interesting that there was a bird that delivered food and sustenance to Elijah. Do you remember what kind of bird it was? Yeah, ravens did that. A bird we associate with death was a source of life for Elijah. They brought him meat in the morning and in the evening. And so my question to you is, how much do you trust God? Elijah was convinced, first of all, that God spoke to him. And he acted upon that belief. I mean, let's think about this. He's going to go before the king of Israel, and he's going to say, it's not going to rain unless I say so. Not Baal. 
But until God tells me to tell you it's going to rain, it's not going to rain. That's pretty risky. Because what if that rain tomorrow? Or next week? Or next month? Then Elijah's going to look like a fool, right? And then Elijah hides and he waits. And he trusts God to meet his needs. I mean, you, you read it. It says, God told him, hey, leave here. Go hide in this ravine. All, stay all by yourself. And I'll provide for you. I'll send a bird that's associated with death to give you life. And Elijah says, okay. I'll go. Do you have that kind of faith? There are actually two droughts that are happening at the same time. Uh, during this period of Elijah and Ahab. There's this drought for water we've been reading about. But according to chapter 18, verse 4, Ahab's wife Jezebel, she had also been killing the prophets of God. So there's this spiritual drought. There's this lack of God speaking. In Amos 8, verse 11, it says, The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will send a famine through the land, not a famine of food or thirst for water, but a famine of hearing the words of the Lord. There's a song about mercy me, and it says, Word of God speak, would you pour down like rain, washing my eyes to see your majesty, to be still and know that you're in this place. Please let me stay and rest in your holiness. Word of God speak. This song goes on to say that we need to seek God beyond the noise, that we need to listen for his voice instead of our own thoughts or the words of other people. Jesus would repeatedly say, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. Let him hear what? The voice of God. And so I want to bring us full circle this morning. We began by considering the ways in which we listen for God to speak to us and we acknowledge that there are all these other voices that distract us. So let me ask you this important question. Are you presently experiencing a spiritual drought in your life in which you seldom hear God speak? Let me remind you, it's not because he's not speaking. It's because we're not listening. We're choosing to pursue the gods of this world instead of the one who can truly sustain us. We're so easily distracted, so tempted by these other voices, the voices of compromise, the voices of complacency. Ezekiel 33, verse 31 says, My people come to you as they usually do, and set before you to hear your words, but they do not put them into practice. Their mouths speak of love, but their hearts are greedy for unjust gain. Uh, look at that. Look closely at that. My people come to you as they usually do and set before you to hear your words. That sounds an awful lot like this, doesn't it? Uh, of where we come week after week to hear God's word. But then it says, but they do not put them into practice. So I want you to consider some probing questions today. And I'm just going to ask you to bow your head just so there's no distractions. There's nothing mystical about bowing your head and closing your eyes other than just an opportunity for just you to really listen to God's voice. And first, I just want you to ask yourself, what are the prevailing voices that you are listening to on a regular basis? Is it music? Or social media? Or the television? Maybe it's the people in your life. Maybe it's your own voice. Have you got it in your mind? Do those voices honor God?
And then you need to ask yourself if there's any sin in your life that you take lightly. Is there anything that you just miss? A sinful behavior? Are there things that you say and know that the things that you do that you know are wrong but you don't have any conviction about? What is it that you're thinking about right now that you're saying, I don't want to acknowledge that as a sin? You need to admit it. You need to confess it. You need to change it. And then third, God, has he spoken to you about something that you've been ignoring? Has he been convicting you of something? Has he been prodding you to do something? And then finally, I would just ask, when was the last time you prayed, word of God speak? Dear Jesus, we ask that you speak into our hearts and our minds today. May we open our eyes and our ears to hear from you. In Jesus' name. I'm going to ask you to stand to your feet with me, please. This is the time where you can continue those conversations with God and allow Him to speak to you. Hebrews says, Today, if you hear God's voice, do not harden your heart. So, I would just ask that you take a moment and say, God, speak to me. And then you respond accordingly. There might be somebody here who doesn't have a relationship with Jesus, and you need to settle that in your heart and your mind today. And pray a prayer of faith and confession to give your life to Him. Maybe there's somebody here who needs to take that next step of faith and be obedient through baptism. And God's been talking to you about that, and you haven't responded yet. And this needs to be a point of decision. Maybe there's that thing that is not quite ready to let go of yet that he's been convicting you of. Confess that to him today. Ask him to help. This is your time now to interact with the Lord. So would you do that as we sing this together? The Savior's way, hymn number 321.
need volunteers too to help start all this. Okay, wonderful. Yes, we definitely need volunteers. It usually takes 40 or so people to make that work. So if you're willing to help us, it's on Tuesday night, October 31st, out to our community. So look forward uh, to that. All right, let's pray and be dismissed today. Wayne, do you care to close us out for prayer? Dear Jesus, Lord, what a privilege it is to be here this morning to hear your voice.